Hello, everyone. In the 53rd episode of the Hewlett Packard's Lab podcast from Research to Reality, I have a great honor and pleasure to host Larry Kaplan, Senior Distinguished Technologist and Software Architect in HPC and AI Business. Hello, Larry. Hi, Dan. Glad to be here. Larry, uh, you have had a very rich career. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So uh, I started off uh, doing computer science at uh, Dartmouth College and uh, then attended, uh, after a couple of years, graduate school at New York University, the Courant Institute, uh, working with Alan Gottlieb on parallel computing, and then uh, moved to the Terra Computer Company in Seattle. Um, there was a little bit of work prior to that at a company called both Boranic and Newman that dabbled in supercomputing yeah. for a little while, uh, but that um, they got out of the business and then I went to Terra. Uh, we were working on an esoteric computer architecture there for a while, and then the opportunity came uh, to buy the Cray business unit from Silicon Graphics in 2000. Uh, so we did that and then moved to making uh, uh, massively parallel processing computers. Uh, and then from there, we basically established a very, very good business on the high end of supercomputing until ultimately we were acquired uh, a few years ago by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So you've seen multiple cultures. Did you notice any differences between Terra, Cray, BBM, HP? Yeah, so um, I mean, BBM, we were, it was a very research-oriented company. Um, but again, right, they, they really weren't necessarily a business or a product-oriented company. Terra, of course, was a startup, so very small. We eventually grew to maybe 100 people, but never really got to full product. We had a couple of prototypes. Um, finally, though, after uh, the Cray acquisition, then we became a real product company. And so that's really where I think, you know, I started really experiencing what it meant to be an operating system lead and an architect. Uh, those were the jobs I had initially and eventually became the chief software architect for Cray. Um, that culture was very directed at just the high end of supercomputing. Uh, and so we had very focused leadership on just that market. And then since the acquisition by uh, HPE, you know, things have broadened a bit. Um, there's a lot more things going on in our business unit, uh, not only HPC and the high-end supercomputing systems, much broader addressing of HPC markets plus mm -hmm. AI, and of course, plus the research arm and labs, which is a lot more than, than we had available uh, at the, on the Cray side. I think the other aspect, though, of that larger uh, organization is it's a bit more democratized, you have a little bit more freedom in, in what you're uh, investigating and who's really setting the agenda. Uh, and so that does give uh, more opportunities and more challenges. And it's really interesting to me, but both our audience and myself would like to know what specific contributions did you have as a software architect? What are your responsibilities? So the responsibility, certainly starting with uh, as the chief software architect at Cray and you know in my beginnings here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, are really uh, making sure the entire software stack hangs together and that the different pieces uh, understand what's required mm -hmm. And the engineers building those different pieces understand what's required from the other teams and how the different requirements uh, need to be met in order so that the whole thing operates as a single whole. Uh, that's really the main part of the job is doing that coordination, both in current software systems and also future looking software systems. When we acquired Cray, and even before that, I knew that one of the key distinguishing features of Cray computers was software. So it looks like you left some solid trail behind you. Uh, can you explain why and how do you think you can take that experience, very positive experience, great results, and apply to HP software? Yeah, so, um, you know, in the software, there's a lot of different components of software we have to deal with. I would say, you know, I've focused mostly on system software management, operating systems, and communication software, but we've also had a long history in programming environments. The programming uh, environments were by necessity back in the old Cray vector days. Uh, without Cray vectorizing compilers, it would be very hard for scientists to make use of the machines. And then as we wanted to become more productive, other aspects of software came, came into play. And so um, I think those are the you know, really important things 
that happened in terms of building these high-end systems, making sure that the integrated software stack can actually meet the needs of the customers, not just in having some hardware that they have to figure out what to do with, but providing operating software so that they can actually run the systems and make good productive use of them, and then of course for the applications on top of that. I'm really glad you mentioned customers. Um, in your um, distinguished, senior distinguished technologist role, you're also responsible for working with customers. Do you like it? How does it, how do you, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, certainly one of the most interesting parts of the job is trying to understand the customer needs. Uh, since the other part was translating that into how it gets implemented, I need to know really what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And again, that spans the breadth of the programming environments, operating systems, and management systems as well. And some of the communication stacks get folded in to various components, especially in operating systems and programming environments. So those interactions are really great. I've spent a lot of time um, you know, looking at RFIs and RFPs, talking with customers, trying to understand the details of what they're really looking for. I think one of the, one of the challenges we always have is customers want to say exactly what they need in terms of a requirement. As an engineer, I'd much rather hear there are use cases so that we can work with them to fulfill those requirements. And this is part of the conversation that we always have. And, and it's frankly, it is, it is enjoyable to have those conversations to understand those needs. And probably pain points, not just use cases. Certainly pain points comes into it. Um, you know, I'd like, again, like to look at it from the point of view of um, how do you accomplish this use cases and what are the roadblocks in your way of, mm -hmm. of getting there. So, it, but I think it's, it's relatively equivalent. So you mentioned a couple of roles as a senior distinguished technologies. What are other aspects of your... So I think, you know, those are two of the big ones is working with customers and getting the requirements into the company, getting the teams to understand all of those requirements. There's also um, basically working to understand what's out there in terms of technology and what we should be chasing and not just getting that from customers, but also understanding from a technology point of view and a general market point of view what's out there. I think the other thing that I do enjoy is the community participation. So working with conferences and academic communities on development of new ideas, that's another great source of understanding where things are going. If you think back in your career, what was most gratifying? Well, you know, delivering, I'd say, these, these exascale systems and the mm. large procurements is, is certainly one of the most gratifying things. This is something that I've wanted to do uh, probably since high school or early college is, is, is basically build computers and the software that's required for them to, to deliver tools for customers to do great things. In the spirit of staying positive, I'm not going to ask you what was the least gratifying, but I'm going to ask you, what would you do differently if you would start today? Yeah, so I mean, for me, I was, I was very lucky, and I was, I think, lucky with some of my early decisions of what I wanted to do, and also had some events that happened in a very timely fashion that really helped me along with this career. So the acquisition of uh, Cray by Terra was at a great time where I was able to then become a leader in massively parallel processing, which is what we're doing today, where we're taking you know thousands and thousands of nodes and lashing them together to work on one problem at a time. Um, but I guess you know the advice would be, um, you know, don't be too quick to judge. Make sure that what you choose to do for your career is something that you can be passionate about, that you want to get up in the morning to do. Making money may be nice, but if you have to drag yourself out of bed to go do it, you're not going to enjoy it as much as if you really do, do enjoy it, really are passionate about it, and it's something you're interested in doing. These are great advices for our younger careers, uh, uh, colleagues, and, and one can see the passion coming out of almost every word you put describing your past career. Now, in HP, we take pride of doing the broader good, not just earning money. How does building the fastest supercomputer in the world map on this broader good? Right, so you, you look at what some of, the, some of the things that are being done with these supercomputers, uh, Frontier, some of the ancestors, um, they really are tools to improve the world. And that's one of the things Cray used to uh, live by as one of its themes. Um, but you know, COVID research is being done on them, uh, climate change research, um, there's certainly a lot of good uh, that's 
come out of those systems to improve the world. So I do believe that is one of their important uh, aspects of producing these systems. In your various roles, how do you address diversity, equity, and inclusion? So um, diversity, uh, I think, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, Cray is, did really well at, but HPE definitely has a, a, a strong focus about. It's something that, you know, 20 years ago, I was still seeing some vestiges in the community and stuff, and I think we've come a long way. For my part, um, you know, I think the big thing for me is to make sure voices are heard. Um, whether you're junior, whether you're from a different background, uh, shouldn't matter if you have good ideas. We want to hear, you know, we, we do want to hear them. We don't want to necessarily go off in, on, on bad paths, but we need to entertain these ideas and understand it because I think one of the things that I am a believer in is that diversity provides a better field of mm -hmm. ideas, a broader field of ideas. And I think the other aspect of it is I've also tried to make sure that people are given equivalent recognition for equivalent work. There's been some times where I haven't seen that in the past and have worked to try and correct those situations. Is there anything else you would like to advise um, our younger colleagues and, and older, not just younger? Right, so the other thing that um, I really like to encourage folks is um, even though you might be getting an engineering degree and coding is what you may be doing most of, learn to write. Um, writing is really important. Being able to express yourself is really important, not just for things like documentation, but in design documents and potentially even in academic papers. Um, I myself happen to have a Bachelor of Arts in Computer Science, um, and part of that was taking writing courses, so I highly recommend that. And you're not only talking, you are doing. I noticed you this morning correcting my English, which is not uh, surprising. <laughs> it's unfortunately, I've, uh, I have this eye that catches things a little too often, but I think most people do appreciate it. It is just to so be constructive. So did I, so did I. So building these massively parallel computers, including the fastest one in the world, leaves you with a little spare time. How do you use it? So um, I'm mostly, my, my biggest enjoyment is skiing, both snow and water skiing. Water skiing is probably the big thing for me in Seattle. It's very convenient, uh, though the snow skiing is as well. So I do try and get out if I can at least once a week during the summer. And of course, winter, you know, when I can, when I can get away. Um, and then also some bike riding. I used to play some ultimate Frisbee, though, not so much anymore. Uh, but I think those are my main, my main relaxations. So is water skiing better on the East Coast or West Coast and the same for uh, snow skiing? So the snow skiing is clearly better in the West. Um, it's uh, a little icy in the East. Um, you know, we in, in Seattle, we have cascade concrete, which is not as light as the snow that's in Colorado, but it's still a lot lighter than what we got back East. The water skiing, the nice thing about uh, the water skiing here, though I did have a little bit about in, in the east when I was uh, in college up in the mountains, is the lake sits in the foothills, mm -hmm. and so it's very well protected. So the water is much calmer where I water ski in Seattle than where I water skied in the Boston area. Uh, so that, uh, you know, especially if I can get out during the week, um, the conditions we get are just really beautiful. At the end of discussion, I usually seek advices or recommendations for the good book. Have you read any? Do you have any? So yes, uh, I think one of my favorite authors of recent is, uh, is Peter Watts. And uh, the most recent book was Blind Sight that I read of his. Uh, and then I'm also a big fan of Werner Vinge. Great insights. Thank you very much, Larry. I highly appreciate all the advices, both in my name and of the whole audience. It was a pleasure.